skills. Um, what I am going to talk to you about today is <clears throat> how we think about theory, really the function of theory, not like how to write a good one, but really more like why we have theory in the first place, which was a need uh, that uh, me and Yurun and Don saw uh, as we were reading a lot of the things that had been written in AMR and other places about the nature of theory and the problems with it. One other thing I want to say is, unfortunately, I've got a I've got a um, in uh, another presentation at in group uh, interdisciplinary network for research for groups research right after this, so I'm going to have to split exactly at the 90 minute mark. However, please, if there was more you wanted to follow up with me, if we don't get to talk enough, or you out of the questions, uh, absolutely uh, find me, send it, send me a note, reach out. I'm more than happy to talk about stuff. Um, my email is mcronin at gmu.edu, and Brad, if you could just stick that in the chat for me, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Okay, so let me get started here. All right, first, a word from our sponsor. So Astrid Hamann and I are the editors of Organizational Psychology Review, and one of the things that we're trying to do as we think about theory is be broader on how we think about theory, which is why we wrote the editorial from the new editors. And so we want to definitely encourage people to publish there um, because we absolutely want to sort of start to broaden the way we think about theory as it serves its functions in management science. And I'm going to also put a plug for a paper that Herman Guinness and I are writing together on the nature of what makes good for good theory that will be coming out in organizational psychology review and however long it takes us to get a review. In any case, you know, um, the problem is that we hear a lot about theory being in crisis. Now, it's funny because some people say, oh, is it really crisis? You know, enough people are writing enough articles in good places about the problems with theory and why we have too much of it and why it's nonsense and all of this other stuff. I, I, I think it's a crisis. I think it merits that. And um, there are legitimate complaints, right? So John Matthew said, you know, we're too enamored with shiny objects and special weird situations. And, uh, you know, Don Hambrick has written that, you know, we just write so much of this theory and it's so much and where it's overwhelming. And Torish, of course, took this even further and said, you know, this is why there's all this nonsense of what we try and teach. And, you know, when you read what they write, there's a basis there, right? You know, there's a basis for what they're saying. So when we ask the question, well, why is this? There are also explanations, right? So Hombrick says we, you know, we, we fetishize almost theory and that causes us to want to, you know, sort of always produce it whether or not we need it. Edwards will, will of course point out that most theories aren't tested. So we have all of these theories that are not actually, they're, they're, they're speculative, but they're not proven, but they're treated as though they are. We, we all know the unfortunate, you know, if you, if you publish something in AMR and then you try and test it in AMJ, it won't get published because there's no contribution, which is absurd. But nonetheless, that's kind of where we are. All right. And then, of course, Antonakis has written a lot of really good stuff on sort of the how novelty is really pulling the field apart. What I'm going to tell you is that these are all true but fixing them is not gonna fix the problem. That's where I'm going, okay? But first I'd like to read to you a short parable um, from, uh, it was written in the 60s and um, it's in the front of our paper, I'm forgetting who the, the author was, but they wrote, once upon a time there was an activity called scientific research and the performance of this activity were called scientists. However, they were builders who constructed edifices called explanations or laws by assembling bricks called facts. The brick makers became obsessed with the making of bricks. When reminded that the ultimate goal was edifices, not bricks, they replied that if enough bricks were available, the builders would be able to select what was necessary and still continue to construct edifices. And so it happened that the land became flooded with bricks. It became necessary to organize more and more storage places called journals and more and more elaborate systems of bookkeeping to record the inventory. It became difficult to find the proper bricks for a task because one had to hunt among so many. It became difficult to find a suitable plot for construction of an edifice because the ground was covered with loose bricks. It became difficult to complete a useful edifice because as soon as the foundations were discernible, they were buried under an avalanche of random bricks. And saddest of all, sometimes no effort was made even to maintain the distinction between a pile of bricks and a true edifice. 
this is the problem in parable form, right? We as scientists deal in justified true beliefs. That's bricks. But those beliefs only make sense and affect change and affect what we do when they are assembled into meaningful structures, the edifice. So theory is the connection between the findings and what they mean collectively. Now, a lot's been written about how theory has to be solid and valid. That's how theory relates to bricks, right? But in fact, there's also how theory relates to edifices. And this is the part that gets overlooked. This is what we wrote about. So there's really two kinds of theory, and this is a distinction that's unfamiliar. It's Wagner and Berger's distinction, and it's the one we sort of wanted to use to, 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 to develop what we were thinking, right? The process of building is that empirical ver work verifies conceptual relationships, and those relationships are structured into models. Those models are unit theories. They're theories of a specific situation that are typically published in our journals. And then together, those unit theories are what makes sense of a topic, right? So if we were thinking about conflict, there are specific unit theories about task conflict, relationship conflict, process conflict, status conflict, how these things relate to each other. All those unit theories fit together into the programmatic theory on conflict. So analogously, it's not just that we go from bricks to buildings. We take bricks and we build structures like staircases, and then we build buildings which are where managers kind of live. Okay, the problem is the programmatic theory part has kind of lost attention. So what you see a picture of here is what's called the mystery house. This is actually in California. And of course, you know, my, my hat's off to, uh, to Jerry Davis for, for writing this metaphor, right? The mystery house was a house that was constructed where stairways led to ceilings and doors led into walls. And it made no sense because the woman who owned it, uh, Ms. Winchester, was afraid of ghosts that were from the people, her husband of the Winchester gun uh, fame. All of the people who were killed by those weapons, she was afraid were going to haunt them. So she built this house. Okay, I don't know about the sense of that, that, but whatever. That is where it came from. And it's in California. And Jerry's point was, management's kind of become this. We have all of these theories that make no sense together. And that, and I'm gonna take Andy Vandeven's quote down there. She says, the impeccable micro logic is creating macro nonsense. Now, I think he meant that with micro macro in terms of level, but you could also say that in terms of unit versus programmatic theory. So why is that? All right, well, let's first be really clear about the distinction between unit and programmatic theory. And I'm gonna tell you, don't get hung up on it. And I'll tell you why in a second but I just need you to understand that there are things that we use first. Oh, sorry. The, I want to say that, you know, a long time ago, Sutton and Saul wrote that the literature on theory can leave people more confused, right? And since then, people did write a lot to try and clarify what theory is and should be, right? So here are some of the ones that are really, you know, some of my favorites. But the problem is these are all about how to write unit theory. These are all about how to write what goes into AMR, a theory of a thing, right? A specific situation that will presumably relate to some broader pro programmatic theory. But it's all about how that theory should relate to the data. And it's a lot less about how that theory should relate to other theory. Now, unit theory, again, the theory of a specific thing like task conflict is important because it's what tells us what we could hypothesize, right? What might be true? And it is, of course, what we test to see what is actually true, right? Unit theory is critical because without it, we don't know what to do with the data that we have or the empirics. And as much as that data tests the theory, the theory also justifies the test, right? So that's a really important feedback loop between the two. At the same time, programmatic theory is what happens when you put unit theories together. And that's what tells us what we know. That is what Jerry Davis would call the settled science, right? So all of the different theories about how conflict work tell us about conflict. And they tell us about that because they make sense together, hopefully, right? And that's really important because when you think about, well, what do we know about conflict? That's the basis for saying, what's the theoretical contribution of a new study 
Or what should I do in my organization if we're having conflict, right? To even understand what that conflict is and what we should do requires programmatic theory. So another way to split this part, right? Unit theory is what makes sense for a particular investigation, right? How task and relationship conflict affect group performance. Whereas programmatic theory is the sum of the knowledge, right? What task and relationship conflict collectively tell us about conflict. You can also think about the difference between where it's stored. So unit theory is what is in the front of an AMJ paper that says this is what where our contribution is, or it's a standalone theory in an AMR or an organizational psychology review paper. It says here's a different way research should, here's some research that we should do. Programmatic theory is rarely stored in an article, right? Sometimes it's in a like an integrative review like the annals. Um, or sometimes it might even be in a systematic review if someone is actually looking at a theory in a more, um, you know, in, looking at the concepts rather than how to apply it to something. But most of the time we learn programmatic theory as we start to become part of a community of practice. So again, for all the people who study conflict, they know the programmatic theory. For all the people who study turnover, they know the programmatic theory. It's a collection of knowledge. They're validated by different processes also, right? Unit theory is validated by its correspondence to empirical data. The more effectively it predicts, the better the theory is. The more it can predict, the better the theory is. But there are still boundaries on what a unit theory can predict. Programmatic theory comes from the synthesis of the unit theories. So we can say we know something uh, if we can say that the unit theories make sense together. So I'll give you a place where that's not true. Uh, that would be creativity research. So there are a million unit theories in creativity research that say um, being international makes you more creative, being uh, happy makes you more creative, being this makes you more creative, being that makes you more creative. There's a lot of those. Unfortunately, despite all the things that make us more creative, creativity is very rare. So there are some problems in the way all those theories fit together, meaning they don't. So. Programmatic theory needs to make sense by all the unit theories sort of making sense together. And so we refine these things over time, right? Unit theory is refined as models are refined, right? As certain models, you know, like certain components, maybe this is a moderator, not a mediator. Maybe this, this is a mediator, not something else we thought. Whereas programmatic theory evolves as the research conversation evolves, right? So again, in the examples here, I said, Two bad analyses showed that task conflict didn't improve group performance, which is what everyone thought. So people started adding moderators and putting in mediators and things like that. That's a different kind of evolution than the typologies of conflict that grow, right? So cognitive and affective conflict actually didn't grow. They disappeared in the, and it got absorbed into task and relationship conflict then process conflict emerged out of that, which then could was split into sort of coordination and disruption conflict. Sometimes people reinterpret these things. So, so um, Laurie Weingart and a lot of my colleagues and friends, you know, wrote about conflict expression as a different way to think about conflict, right? That's a different level and it's conceptual of evolution. All right, now I've said a lot, some of you guys might be thinking, all right, wait, what, who, what now, right? So, um, so unit theory may be about a, so I'm just, I just opened this back up, right? Yes, for sure, 1963, thank you. So unit theory is about a piece of a big puzzle. Programmatic theory is the explanation for the big puzzle itself. Yes, absolutely, exactly, thank you. And what I wanted to do here was, um, you know, is programmatic theory built synthesized out of empirical facts? Um, so, as, or is it a cognitive invention? Well, I would say this is actually a great example here, right? Where I wanted to say, programmatic unit theory are, here's what I think is happening in a specific situation. And when we get enough of that, you, we can say, here's what I think is happening in a topic. So it's all, it all has to fundamentally be copacetic with empirical reality, right? You know, a programmatic theory at its core should be a set of validated and consistent and coherent unit theories, which should have been validated with empirical, multiple empirical studies. But there's still constructs, right? There's still things we think of, right? Identity, right? And liminal identity and 
you know, all, you know, marginal identities and all, all sorts of things. Right? These, are, these are things that we make in order to make sense of a complicated world. And it's less important to get hung up on the difference between the two than that they have to sort of support each other. So I'll give you an example, going back to task conflict. So we find that task conflict does not improve group performance, which is not how it was theorized. So people do a lot of other empirical work and they find a couple things out. They find three things that are fairly important. One is that there's a curvilinear relationship. So the right amount of task conflict is a moderate amount. Too much or too little is no good. And they also find that, that trust is a mediator, that you know, without trust, task conflict is no good. And they also find that task conflict is worse if it occurs with a lot of relationship conflict. Now, all three of those things were theorized and empirically validated. And all three of them don't exactly fit together in a clear way, right? They might fit together, but we don't know if, you know, is it really that trust is the key factor? Do they all explain different variants, right? Does one mask another? We don't know. In contrast, brainstorming is like, brainstorming says there's three things that cause group brainstorming to be less good than individual brain brainstorming. Valuation apprehension, people don't like to be evaluated. Um, social loafing, right? They think other people do it. And production blocking, meaning that when you say something, it interferes with what I'm saying. Now, that's actually something where the theories fit together very well. Those three theories explain different variants. They eventually emerged from a lot of research um, on how the different mechanisms that sort of prevented group brainstorming to work well together, they all fit together. That is a good process of unit theory becoming programmatic theory. And what you'll notice is that it seems like um, the group brainstorming can be said very succinctly, right? You could almost say, well, we could just test that in one study. Yes, we can now, right? That reflects hundreds and hundreds of studies on different mechanisms and different theories that were tested and eventually whittled down into this very nice coherent package. So that is the way the process should work. Now, let me, let me answer a couple questions here just because they're coming up. Um, and uh, Sivan, I see you, but just let me um, say a couple things first. Um, so people are talking about sort of inductive, deductive, qualquant and data. All of these things are tools by which we create evidence for the theories, right? So again, all of these things to me are ways to sort of say there's, um, you know, this is what the data say, right? All that matters for us really is that empirical work validates small theories, unit theories, and those theories have to somehow coalesce together. So it all has to align. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, yes, and okay. So the person who just raised their hand, you disappeared off my screen. Can you can you say it? Can you come come on back? Yeah. Well, how oh, are sorry. You? Yes. Uh, hi. Um, thank you so much for this. Um, and I'm just trying to yes contribute to the interactive nature. I'll do a little song and dance. Yeah. Um, but my my question had was related to you. Um, the example about the task conflict and the brainstorming. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering one one other thing that I noticed is that the brainstorming research all points in a singular direction. It yes. has one clear conclusion that, okay, brainstorming is bad, we should do you know, individual. But I'm wondering task conflict, it kind of points in all these different directions. Yes. And so I'm wondering if you can just kind of talk about how you, I guess, do programmatic theory when we don't have a clear, when there's kind of not <laughs> one clear answer of brainstorming is bad or conflict is good. And you are anticipating where I'm going. Right. That's exactly. Okay. Problem, so, okay. Great. Right? I will That's then. exactly the problem. It's about how you, the the unit to programmatic distinction is about how these things have to fit together. Right. It's less important which one you classify it as because in fact it will change over time. Right. Enough work will get done that things will be structured into understood relationships. Right. So um, so let me so let me this was the model that I put in the paper, right? That empirical work 
lets us build unit theory, right, and test it. And that, and then over time, when we integrate those unit theories, this is what you just said, like they're pointing in different direction, it makes it harder to integrate. But a better model, the one that we actually had before that unfortunately we had to get rid of uh, was this one, right? Empirical, I think it's easier to understand. Empirical work specifies relationships that are put together into different unit theories and tested for their validity, and then hopefully aligned into broader programmatic theory which then can either go back and suggest new unit theories, right? Or new empirical work, or we can teach it to practitioners. We can say, this is what we know about conflict, right? Especially if it's coherent, right? If it's coherent, we could say, listen, if you're gonna have brainstorming, don't do it in a group. If you are gonna do it in a group, here's how you do it round robin to make sure everyone can, can, can be effective, right? And, and this is actually, when I think about our journals, this is sort of how we arrange our findings, right? What should happen is that the stuff that is empirically tested in AMJ should have a clear relationship to the theories that work in AMR, right? They should, they should be testing those theories. Um, occasionally we'll get a discovery, something that does not make sense with what we know. And that will, again, create maybe a theory that has to be through abduction that has to be tested. When we have enough unit theories, we can say, let's integrate them all together and say, here's what we know about this topic, right? Here's what we know about conflict right now. And then maybe we can teach that to folks with, you know, AMLE say, here's a, an update on what we know about this right now. This is how it could work. This is how, this is the, the dream, but that's not how it works. So here is the system now. This is a stock and flow model. Any of you who know me know that this is gonna show up in anything I ever do. And a stock and flow model is simply a product. It's a little bit different than a box and arrow model because the stocks are like bathtubs, right? They're things that fill in empty. And these pipes are like flows, right? So they tell you what goes in and what comes out. Um, so this is actually, this model that I'm showing you here is the, really the same as this one or this one, it's just a little bit, it's in a systems dynamic uh, framework because it's important because I want you to understand that there is an inflow of empirical analyses that verifies hypotheses. But some of those hypotheses are failed to be supported so they leave, right? This is what should happen. What's left get formulated into a unit theories and hopefully published, right? Similarly, if we're starting with the unit theory in AMR, we're thinking about, well, what's the appropriate way to make a test, right? What's the appropriate way to make a design, right? So we don't, anything doesn't go, it limits that, right? That's good. So with our unit theories though, when we test them, we can see where they're redundant, where they're wrong, and then we can refine those unit theories. This again is an outflow, right? These are the faucets going in and these are the drains coming out. And eventually, when, as we have enough unit theories, we can say, these fit together into programmatic theory. And the programmatic theory can help us understand, well, what's, why is that important? Why does this unit theory merit becoming part of the programmatic theory? So again, while this, um, this diagram looks a little strange, just think about it as a series of like, you know, like a production model. We create something here, it goes into this stock of verified hypotheses, which then we assemble by building processes into unit theory. We assemble the unit theories through integration processes into programmatic theory, and we hopefully get rid of what either doesn't get supported, what either turns out to be a little bit wrong, right? If we think that there's a mediator that works and it turns out it doesn't, and what's redundant. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these things going over as we continue. This is again, a production model. So. Here's one of the problems that we talked about in the beginning. Too much theory. Uh, yeah, Julius. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have one question regarding yeah. like the, because you mentioned it just uh, quickly with the, like, the practitioner orientation, because what, to me, what is missing maybe in this whole build is where, where does, do we actually solve problems from managers? Yes. Because they, they can't, I mean, theory is good and important, just to, to finish this sentence, maybe. And, but like theory does not have managers, right? But where, where is this in the model or is this not included in there? It is, I'm glad you asked, um, because that was this, this little pipe at the bottom, 
practitioners draw on settled science. The thing that gets overlooked is that when we start, when anybody starts to think about what do I do in this situation, I come in and I see that my team is fighting, right? Whether I'm a manager or I'm a researcher, I'm going to say, what is this and what do we know about it? Is this norming, forming? Is this conflict? What is it? That's programmatic theory, right? So the manager, and this is, I think, one of the problems with a lot, and I'll get back into it. The conversation is often that we think the unit theory, what get published, gets published in AMR, is what a manager is going to read. And I'm saying, I say day nay. I say what a manager would use has to be more refined than that. It has to be, you know, a collection of unit theories, right? A manager doesn't want to know just about task conflict. They actually want to know about conflict. And if task conflict is part of that, great. But to get here, we have to build stuff. And this is, again, you, you're sort of anticipating where I'm going. Um, one more thing I'll say about that is, right, this is kind of a within our house look. One of the things I've said in, the, in, in other work I've written is that we often think about the marketplace of knowledge, but the marketplace is not really a good um, analogy for what we create. Because the marketplace is like, you know, selling oranges or like, you know, farmer's market. Like you come in, you look at my cake, you say, is this a good cake? Do I want to buy a different cake? But you can tell what a good cake is. You hope that I've made a good cake. We are more like building cars, right? You go to buy a car, but what you interact with is about 5% of what makes the car work. The car does not work unless a lot of other people have spent a lot of time integrating the systems to make it work appropriately. And that's what gets lost when we think you can go straight from the finding into like into practice. We'll come back to this again, but it's a really important point. Um, um, so, and uh, just a quick, uh, Hong asked if I have a, a paper on stock flow models, and I do. It's with Jeffrey Vancouver. It's in the Handbook of Multi-Level Modeling, where we, we, we write about dynamic theory and how to use stock and flow models. Um, okay. Um, so, um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the problems and why they don't get solved with the way we usually think about it, right? One is too much theory. Right. This is usually people have said there's too much theory. What they really mean is there's too many unit theories, too many different explanations for how things uh, could be taking place. Right. And it leads to conflicting findings. And so that does a couple things. First is that, you know, when we, we love novelty. And so that means everyone's trying to come up with a new theory for something. Right. And we also don't do replication. Right, which again is that was Edwards' finding, you know, and so there's nothing to take away either the false hypotheses or the theories that come from them, which is the refinement, right? So we have this big bunch of unit theories that's, you know, more and more is coming up, it's getting, it's overflowing. So people say, hey, we got to like relax the demand for theory. Okay, but a couple things we got to say first is that you may not need a unit theory but you always need programmatic theory, right? Even in the writing on um, a theoretic research, which is Miller, he said, a theoretic research, this is the title of the article is in praise of a theoretic research, bears little or no connection to pre-existing or future theory. And Hambrick used this to say, um, let's look at this you know, finding, political connections affected firm bail bailouts by promoting illicit behavior. He said, this paper lacks any theoretical trappings relying on the prima facie importance of the topic. But that's not exactly right, because if you actually read the article he's citing, bailouts and political connectedness are both concepts that people in finance were writing about, and the findings were specifically connected to those programs of research. We couldn't make sense of what any of this means without some programmatic knowledge to say, what, what is this we're talking about? So do you always need a unit theory to explain an empirical finding? No. Do you always need to have some idea of what that empirical finding might relate to? Yes. And that's actually the sort of point that Academy of Management Discoveries makes all the time. And if Kevin, if you're on and you want to correct me on that, please go ahead. But that's the sort of joy of that journal. It says, hey, 
how does this finding relate to what we thought we knew about the topic? So you always need programmatic theory. All right, but let's, let's get away from that and say, okay, yeah, but still we can publish empirical work without unit theory. Great, now we have a different problem. We may have shut this inflow, right? Now we've just got all sorts of hypotheses here that are verified. We basically shifted the overflow from the unit theory to the verified hypothesis stock. Now we just have a lot of those. And we still have a ton of unit theories, right? So shutting the faucet does not open the drain, right? And so until we can find a way to open the outflows to unit theory, which are refinement and integration, we're still gonna have this whole big mess of stuff that is going to you know, continue to confuse what the actual truth is. Okay, so what do we need to do? We need to actually open these outflows. And these are all different. I talk about them in, um, I talk about them in the paper, but we actually need a lot more writing on what these processes mean. Refinement, again, as I said, is about taking a unit theory and making it more parsimonious and getting rid of all of the stuff that we don't need, right? So to, to go back to task conflict, to say what really is the reason that task conflict is not helpful, right? What can we get rid of, right? Which requires falsification and empirical work, right? We also, though, need integration. Integration, in a way, makes too much theory seem like not so much theory because it makes it coherent, right? We can under, I always think about Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is a really, really complicated show, but we understand it because everything gets integrated. All those things fit together, right? That's the beauty of, you know, sort of working memory and long-term memory, right? Which is that we can understand things when they are well integrated. Um, we also need to get rid of redundancy. And I'm gonna come back to that in just a second, right? Meaning that like when we find that we have multiple theories that really talk to the same kind part of a topic, we have to get rid of them, right? And we're gonna, I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. Yeah, Lika, is that how you pronounce your name? That's okay. right, that's right. Okay. Thanks, thanks for this, this is uh, very interesting. Um, my doubt was that I understand that uh, from what you explained, unit theory looks more like uh, an incremental approach and a programmatic theory would be like taking a step back and trying to look at the larger picture and trying to say that, okay, ABC join together to make a cohesive picture and this is what it looks like. Uh, uh, am I wrong in understanding that, uh, let's say a, a comprehensive review paper would be a sort of a programmatic theory where you're trying to kind of bring together what studies have been done on a particular topic and trying to say, you know, this is how it is going to look like in future. Or, or yeah. is it that some review papers can be unit theories and some review papers can be programmatic theories? Oh, great. No, you, you, you've exactly got it. So yeah, so most of the time, comprehensive reviews on a topic, right? So again, conflict, turnover, identity, a big topic, right? With a lot of research and a lot of theories. Put those together in an integrative way, that's absolutely, in a review, that absolutely is a programmatic theory. Could you have a unit theory review? Sure, right? Unit theories on opening offers, right? A review of opening offers, that's very narrow. Opening offers is a part of negotiation, right? And, um, but again, the size and scope is really what we're talking about that, in the difference, right? And so that was exactly correct. Um, yeah, Henrik. Okay. Yeah, uh, so uh, this goes back to a question I posed in the chat before about uh, whether or not these programmatic kind of high level theories are just inductively generated out of uh, more unit theory, kind of empirical generalizations, low level uh, kind of facts, or if they're if you see a qualitative difference there in the fact that they are kind of cognitive inventions. So for instance, you know, Newton coming up with his laws were not just uh, extrapolations of, you know, measurements of planetary movements, but he came up with gravity and forces and mass and things like that. Uh, rational choice theory, you know, you don't see many people making rational choices, but they're a useful generalization to account for lots of detailed observations. So do you make that kind of distinction that programmatic theory actually is a cognitive construct, whereas unit theory is more generalizations from, from, from data, so to speak? Well, you see, I, I don't want you to make that disconnect, right? Because programmatic theory, um, 
Anne had earlier talked about motivation, like expectancy theory, right? Valence is a is is a yeah. construct, right? Instrumentality is a construct. Um, but that broad topic has a lot of other sort of unit theories underneath it, right? About what makes you know uh, something attractive, right? Rel that relates to valence, right? How we think about expectation, right? Those are the unit theories that sort of are underneath it. So a unit theory has to use those cognitive constructions constructs, right? They have to use the, the things that have been sort of dreamed up gravity, right? But they have to fit together. So different, actually, if you want to use a different one from physics, right? If, if you want to think about how motion happens, right? You can, there is, this is a beaut, there's Lagrangian mechanics, Hamiltonian mechanics, and classical mechanics. That's a beautiful integration of three different unit theories because they all work together and you can derive one from the other, but they use different constructs, right? That's what we're going for. And with that programmatic theory, we have a better way to deal with predicting motion, right? Using a lot of different, uh, like using the right tool for the right job. So, okay. yeah. So, the, so the, the main thing is you want this type of synthesizing coherence and you don't make a huge distinction between one of them being more conceptual innovations, the other ones being closer to observable data. I mean, I, I, I agree that, you know, all data are like theory laden and all, more abstract theories are underdetermined, but uh, you, that's not the big difference in your model here. No, and and unit theory, like I said, has to be validated, right? It has to, like, sometimes somebody has to say, okay, well, here's our constructs, let's measure it, and let's see if this works the way we think, right? And then that has to has implications for what what do we think about programmatic theory? Again, you know, like finding the task conflict didn't work the way we thought said something really like, oh, bad, that's bad about what we think we know about conflict, right? Shook that whole world and caused them to sort of change a lot in the programmatic theory, but it's all got to work together, right? There's, um, so expectancy theory be programmatic. Yes, 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 yes. Dominique, yes. Okay, Pacey, you've had, uh, Henrik, are you are you good or can I, uh, you give other? No, no, I, I'm, I'm good. We don't need to go, go any more on that. <laughs> Okay, I, I'm really like, this is cool. Like a lot of people are talking and I'm like, you know, getting behind, but that's good. So Pacey, what were, what were you, uh, what was your question? Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. Um, let me start my video, hold on. Uh, there we go. Um, so thanks for this, this is super interesting. And you could take this later if it fits better there in terms of sort of uh, practical applications, but I'm thinking about PhD students and how this yeah. uh, relates to what we train them to do. Mm -hmm. So we're always pushing them, you know, what's your theoretical contribution? What's your theoretical contribution? They tend to want to write sort of narratives about the phenomena. But I feel like we're kind of pushing them into programmatic theory often. And what your definition of programmatic theory is makes me think that's the kind of thing that happens later stage in your career. When you're, uh, you know, socialized in an academic community, you, you pointed out kind of a community of practice is key. So should we be focusing PhDs on unit theory? Uh, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I'm going to actually tell you, we focus them on unit theory, not programmatic theory, because if you read anything about how to write theory, it's how to make theory match data. It's how to right. have good constructs. It's how does that get that theory into a journal, right? And it's not about how do we think about the concept more broadly, how do we think about theories together? So we all say, hey, we programmatic theory. We all understand sort of intuitively that programmatic research is what we want and that we want things to all coalesce into a coherent body of knowledge. But we spend our time focusing people on the mechanics, right? And that is why I said, you know, like, you know, you can't empiric your way into coherent programmatic theory, right? A meta-analysis looks at a specific relationship across in all contexts which basically means this relationship holds nowhere, right? And um, if you found, for instance, and this is John's argument, right? In 2006, I believe it's like trust, the meta-analysis of trust is like, it's like, or it was like 0.3, I think it was trust, but some, some construct had a meta-analysis, uh, you know, effect of 0.3, but in this one particular agency, it was negative 0.6, right? It's like, but the, like that doesn't invalidate the meta-analysis and the meta-analysis analysis doesn't invalidate that. It says we don't understand something about how this works in this context, right? Perfect. So that's what we have to sort of get over. And similarly, and this is actually a good, um, uh, well, actually I'm gonna say, yeah, I'm gonna say hold on to because the, the communities of practice is a different problem that I'm gonna get to next, right? Thank because you. this relates to 
how many different explanations do we have for stuff, right? And this is, I, I say, this is the nonsense problem, right? So first of all, nonsense is in part too much bad theory, right? And again, too much novelty. And what's important here is novelty isn't just about opening up like the this uh, flow and making more unit theory. When we write theories to be different from what we know, we get two things. First is we get, a, it's harder to integrate those theories because this new theory just told you why it's unlike all the other theories. Okay, great. Now, how do we put those together? Well, we can't. And the other thing is that this theory may be BS, right? Because when you say here, I have a theory that I have a new theory, it contradicts everything we thought we knew. That's probably type one error, especially if it hasn't been tested, right? Um, or type two error. I always get that wrong. The one that it's a, you know, sort of false positive. Um, so the other thing is people sometimes talk about a lack of rigor, right? You know, and th that would help, right? Because it would help us get rid of constructs that are iffy in their definition. And again, it would help us see when hypotheses aren't supported, but it still doesn't solve the problem of making good programmatic theory for two reasons. And this is where I wanted to get back to the idea of respect and status. Respect and status had two very robust um, uh, sort of programs of research that went on in different ways. And this is, this is reviewed in Blader and Hughes' Annals paper. Uh, they emerged in parallel but they actually were kind of talking about the same thing. That's their conclusion, right? So we had these two silos that kept going together. And because the constructs were defined differently, measured differently, and had their own bodies of literature, you could analyze them empirically to death. You would see that they both were legitimate, right? It was only when stepping back and saying, hey, these are actually talking about the same thing. And that's a long, careful argument they had to make in that, that paper to get it right. Um, so... So, um, so Anne poses the question of like, uh, you know, um, the, uh, so Anne, actually, I'm going to say two things. One is uh, the, I get what you're saying about expectancy theory. And it's funny because we've gone back and forth with that very question. Um, but I think you could make an argument for why it is programmatic because it's, a co it's coherent and has a lot of things that fit underneath its umbrella. But that's less important than the fact that things are moving. Now, you also said, you know, could an arrow go in the other direction? Yes, 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 yes. That was what I was trying to show. I'm going to go back to it um, here with this, these arrows, right? Programmatic theory tell us what do we need to know? What else could we, what else should we do with this theory? Right. Um, we programmatic theory is what allows us to say, hey, you know, um, I think I can take this body of knowledge and take it somewhere else. Right. Which is sort of all the programmatic theory on types of conflict is what got Weingart and her colleagues to say, you know, I think there's a common root to this. And it's about expression and it's about the directness and the intensity of expression. And it is what got me and Kate Bezrykova to say, you know, I think all of this actually there's a time element that's missing. Right, that there's there's a uh, you know the the utility of conflict and the form of the conflict changes over time. It absolutely could go in that direction, and in in terms of the creativity, cr well, I'm going to get back to that one as well. That's another again, you sort of anticipating where I'm going. Um, but what I wanted to say here is that we do need to sort of synthesize because you can have too much theory, right? Um, you can have too much theory just like you can have too many unit theories, you can have redundant programmatic theory. You can have four different names for the same thing, right? That's the jingle and the jangle fallacies, right? And they would true at topics as well. So in fact, if we had novelty, if we said, you know what, programmatic theory all says, this is the way things sh we should think about things. Well, but I found something that contradicts that, you know, that's how we can kind of refine and change the programmatic theory with new unit theory, right? There's absolutely a feedback loop. Again, that is to me the, the joy of discoveries, right? That you, people can say, hey, not, hey, I found something weird empirically because you know it didn't go with my unit theory, but hey, we've all been thinking about this topic you know, in a particular way. 
that's the programmatic theory. And I found something that I can't square, right? That is what's really important. <laughs> Often unit theories do not arrive at truly programmatic integration. Yes, 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 yes. That is the unfortunate sad truth. Um, so in what sense are programmatic theories more than some totals of unit theories? Good question. They're more in that much like I said, what I would wanted to use in the beginning with the example of conflict, right? A laundry list of names for things and differentiations does not a good programmatic theory make, right? In the same, but if you think about like group brainstorming, which really I think of as an excellent example, right? It all has been, again, decades of research have come together to create a very parsimonious and complete theory about how brainstorming in groups is ineffective, how and why, right? It's about the integration and the synthesis. It's about how these things support each other. There is some stuff in conflict that is, like I said, synthesized and a status conflict is one of these. So when status conflict came out, I was actually the reviewer on that paper. And I, and I said, you know, why is this not just like task conflict or a relationship conflict? What does this add? Right. That wasn't a question about can you imp empirically verify it? Right. Can you find evidence for it? But with a scale, it was what does this tell us about conflict that we don't know? Turns out it told us something about a type of conflict that could not be anything but zero sum. And that was sort of straddling between relationship and task conflict and process conflict. It sort of occupied a different and important space. It advanced the study of conflict. Right, but it advanced the study of conflict, the programmatic research, because of its connections to the other kind of theories we had about conflict at the time. So, um, so it's interesting what people are. Sorry, I, I, I wanted to scroll up to the um, what people were saying. So, Henrik, I'm going to call you back out. Would you say what you, a little bit more about like inductively inferred inventions? Because this is, um, I want to make sure we're all sort of like square on this. Yeah, that was more uh, in in relation to the to the chat post by Woody there. Uh, that sometimes just reviewing lots of things don't lead to programmatic theories, which you commented yeah. on. And I, that was my point before that you know very often uh, one one gets the impression that theory generation is some sort of gradual inductive synthesis just taking place because you combine building blocks into a building. But uh, I mean, lots of lots of writing in the philosophy of science has shown that, uh, or argues also that um, that's not really how it happens. You see all these things, and you kind of see a new gestalt, like a new model for making sense of them that is more reasonable than the other ones, and can explain lots of different things, and that can allow you to derive interesting hypotheses for future tests, etc. For instance, okay. Newtonian mechanics or Einsteinian mechanics. You know, it's an invention. Those models. Okay, so, but it's interesting that you said um, the, the inductive part, because I always think about inductive as like sort of coming from data, yeah. right? And, 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 and you're right in this case because, okay, so I, you know, I'm an associate editor of the Academy of Magic Annals. And when we talk about the annals, the annals is a review outlet, right? Mm -hmm. So it means you have to look at what has been published, what exists already. You are not speculating anything. But what allows you to see something new is that you look from a very high level. And so we, mm -hmm. there's a thing we always say, we say, you know, if the AMJ ranks bricks and AMR makes houses, the annals looks at neighborhoods, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you see <laughs> is, oh, I notice when I look across these neighborhoods, this is a difference that we had not picked up on and we hadn't seen. It was there, but we did not see it because we exactly. were looking too closely, which in a way is a bit like natural science, right? Oh, this thing existed. We just didn't see it because we weren't able to at the time, right? And that is why when you have coherence among the unit theories in a programmatic theory, it can highlight those discoveries. Yeah. Right? So that, well, I yeah. just, that's, I'm glad you brought, like I said, that's a very good way to clarify. And thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I made a point earlier about overpowering the theory. What do we do with our sustainability, which a multidisciplinary one may not be able to integrate a lot in such cases? Yeah, so um, the question about like, what do we do when things are different? That is, that is, well, let's see, do I want like, let me, let me hold on before I answer that. Um, I wanna see if I can, uh, you know what? All right, let me answer what you're saying. Um, 
one of the challenges is that science needs to have more unification in its voice. Now, when I say this to a management audience, people jump down my throat and say, oh yeah, like uh, Pfeffer said in 1993. And I'm like, kind of, right? I think that it's more like what E.O. Wilson said in his book, Consilience, right? Which is that we really, really need to have a way to synthesize and integrate across boundaries. Now, there are some things, you know, you know, we can be specialized and coordinated, right? Um, we can, it would be nice if we could, if we, you know, there, there can be sort of pockets who are looking at specific, you know, I don't know, even in, in, if you think about sustainability, right? If there's engineering stuff, maybe me as a manager, I don't need to know the like technical details of the engineering, but there does need to be a way to sort of link to it. That's integration. And that's where I feel like going back to the other question we got earlier, right? Like, what do we teach students? We tend to teach students a way of thinking, right? A, you know, a sort of meta theory, a paradigm, and not a broader way of how to sort of think about evidence and how theories integrate together. This is really, really important for management because we are interdisciplinary, right? There needs to be a way to talk across fields. And actually, if you want to see a field that does as well, it's engineering, right? Engineering, there's basic science, right? Very basic science. Um, and there's also material science, right? Then there's also science of how you build certain things like bridges or chips. It's specialized and coordinated. And that we don't do in management. In management, we, we're very big tent. We sort of think of it like a marketplace. We sort of think it will, you know, sort of coalesce together if we're, we're, we're making new, true and valid knowledge. But I think, Henrik, that, that's why I like your you know, philosophy of science is nah, not really, right? Like we sort of, we, we really have to actually manage how those things get, become integrated. We need structures. And are those structures God's word? Of course not, right? This is, you know, Kant, right? Truth is not knowable, but we can stay, get, you know, as long as we're doing a better job with explanation, prediction, and control of the things we want, that's where we're going. And that all comes down to me to programmatic theory, right? Like when we have a knowledge on a topic, so let's say, um, what is the, with the, the, the um, sustainability, right? Sustainability is an interdisciplinary topic, but it could have its own language. We just want to make sure that that, own, that language connects to all the disciplines that are bringing it together, right? So I still think this would work. Um, all right, so this is where, we were talking about creativity before, and um, you know, one of the points I wanted to make is, you know, if we had, if we just, you know, did research on things that were true, right? Or things that were clear, right? If it was purely empirically driven and all about consistency, we would just have, we would essentially change the bloat from unit theory to programmatic theory because we could have infinite amount of theories on opening offers. We could have an infinite amount of theories on emotion. Any single thing that you want to study, you can study for an infinite amount of time because every new investigation creates more questions than it answers. That is actually the function of novelty. Novelty is not about weird findings in a specific situation. It's about strange findings that cause us to question what we think we know about a topic. So that is actually, I think, how we intuitively judge when, when we say, what's the theoretical contribution? What we really should be thinking about is, does this make us understand something about the mother topic more? And that's, if we look there, then integration would naturally filter out the things that were kind of redundant, obvious, or unimportant, right? And there are a lot of things that are you know, managers already know how to control. We don't need a unit theory, uh, uh, sorry, a programmatic theory on it, right? Or even a unit theory. Um, so we do need novelty, but it needs to be useful novelty. And that usefulness needs to be defined in terms of the programmatic theory, the topic. What do we know? Um, are unit theories more context specific? Why are pro programmatic theories more general? Yes, yes. Unit theories tend to be smaller right? Typically more context specific. Programmatic theory is more, um, again, more like an aggregation. It has to be more sort of more abstract and more general so it can be then applied to particular contexts. Um, all right. The last thing I want to talk about is impractical theory. 
So we hear this a lot, right? Theories are, people complain that theories are not useful or usable, right? Meaning they're not insightful, they're not true, they're not important, right? Uh, science does its best to try and make theories true, right? With validation and, and replication, but that doesn't necessarily make them important and it doesn't necessarily make them insightful. Um, and what we want is theories that managers can eventually use, right? To improve what they do. Um, that's John Matthew has a great comment about, you know, things being in line of sight with the manager. The problem with this is it gets over, I think overstated because we can ground theories in managerial realities, but that is not everything. We are not a natural science. We are a science of the artificial. So the problems that managers have now do not represent the universe of problems that there are. And discovery takes a long time. Like I said, we're not a science of the impatient. So I, yell, I love this picture because I typically say, does anyone know what it is? And most people don't. But what it is, is the most important technological innovation probably of our lifetime. It is the transistor. And the transistor, when it came out, people didn't say, well, I know what this is, how this is gonna be relevant and change things. They had no idea how much it would change or what would be different about it, right? But it was a thing that sort of came out on the way to discovering other types of products that could be built, right? Products being the analog to, to programmatic theory in this case. By the way, the transistor was built based on a discovery, originally it is an empirical discovery that was made 115 years earlier. There are a couple, a couple other discoveries that had to be made for the transistor to exist. Now that's a long, long lag time. And we should appreciate that what we are doing is science. And so it may take a long time before we can say anything to managers because that's what makes us different from journalists, right? Journalists are not as beholden to the data as we are. We really have a duty to truth. And so it takes a long time for us to get it right. That being said, discovery happens everywhere in this process, right? Empirical findings can stimulate new theories, changes to programmatic theories, right? Programmatic theory can get us to look back and say, hey, you know what? I think we have this wrong, right? Um, and it takes time as we do that. So actually, I, I mentioned diversity here, right? When diversity got started, which by the way, you know, managers weren't really clamoring for, right? Uh, that was something that got started. We said, you know, we think this would be useful. Come to find out that it's double-edged sword. Come to find out that really inclusion is important, right? These were evolutions that happened because of systematic research, empirical, unit theory, and coalescing into programmatic theory. That's how we build knowledge. And what's ironic is I think every other science understands this, right? Because in medicine, people understand that, you know, there's bench science will happen a long time before somebody knows what to do with it. Even in computer science, they're inventing things where they don't exactly know what it's going to be used for yet. Um, so we could take a, we could take a bit from this. Okay, so now let me go back and see what some other people have said. Um, is unit theory like substantive theory and uh, programmatic theory like grand theory? I wouldn't say it's grand. I would say it's bigger, right? It's it's it's. Um, you know, I, I think that um, theory becomes programmatic when there's a lot of unit theories that explain how the topic works, and we have a better way to understand how to predict and control across a variety of situations. So it's grander, but, you know, I don't necessarily want to say one thing is more important than another. We do that a lot in this field, right? We sometimes think things are more important when they're more numerous or when they're cooler, right? But again, a car works, right? Like the most numerous things in a car is the screws. It doesn't make it the most important uh, piece, right? Brakes are really important in certain circumstances. Gas is really important in others, right? You know, it all, we, we have to think about how it fits together and collectively works. Um, so, uh, do I think that because management has so many different paradigmatic positions that it makes the emergence of programmatic theory more challenging? Oh my God, yes, 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 yes. And engineering is better because they have a consistent 
position positivism. I think they also have a consistent language, right? Um, so Henrik shook his head. I, I saw that. He said he so he has a different view. That's a deeper discussion and an interesting one that I think is worth having. Maybe not here, but I do want to say that pra pragmatically they have an ontology. They have a way that they can speak consistently, right? They have one word for an integrated circuit. We, if you say, if you search on groups, you won't necessarily get research on teams. That's insane, right? This is one of the big problems that we have, right? And, 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 I, and I think that there needs to be like, I'm a little bit more positivist than probably other things, but that's, you know, there's a lot of ways to understand what, what is true in the world. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, and it's, so Anne wrote about sort of like theory that relates to no real problem in the world. Well, I guess what I would say back to that, Anne, is it may not be a problem yet, right? And so one of my favorite examples here is uh, the EPAM theory of memory. Right, which is about how we sort and understand memory as Figenbaum, and it was in the 60s. Turns out that theory became really important when uh, it was time to figure out how to do speech and text recognition. Right. Um, then there is, of course, the guy who worked on the animal models that were part of what helped us come up with the COVID vaccine. There's a great presentation he gave. I happen to know this because of a colleague of mine, Rango, who's it. Vanderbilt and Ray Friedman, who you might know, who's apparently in this guy's uh, um, book club. He, he sent out uh, a piece explaining how the COVID vaccine worked and saying that may is made possible in a way because of these animal models and they weren't thinking this is gonna help COVID in the future. So there are a lot of things that we don't understand like that will help us with problems later. And I think that's, that's where I don't wanna be too doctrinaire about how are we gonna use this now? Because we often don't know. And that's the history of most inventions. Um, so similar doubts, and what, okay, well, sorry, I'm, uh, since most people in our field uh, are for the unit theory to programmatic theory framework in our field, yet I'm concerned that it's difficult to have a reasonable consensus about how to put these things together. Yeah, for example, the role of top management in organization is an uh, and is an important topic, then it's fair to say upper echelon's theory is a programmatic theory. Again, you know, it's funny because, so let me, before I get to that, let me, let me say one more thing about um, what does practical mean? So I started the paper with a quote, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. And by the way, Art Padian corrected me, that's not Lewin. Right, it's attributed to him. It's actually came way before that. And he's, Bidian has an interesting piece on that. Um, practicality means a lot of different things if we're gonna let this process work, right? Um, level of analysis theory is not really practical to managers. It's really important to researchers, right? Um, if you're doing theory on uh, something related to conflict, it may not be important to you if you're doing research on organizational infrastructure, right? Like practic practical means different things across this field and across our constituents, right? A policymaker wants to know what's gonna work in general. A manager wants to know what's gonna work for me right now. A researcher wants to know, uh, before I tell you what's gonna work for you right now, can I validate that what I'm saying is true, right? A reviewer wants to know, okay, given that you're saying that this is a new contribution, did you make that argument effectively, right? Practical theory is about how concepts and constructs relate to each other in a systematic way. And that's practical for a lot of different reasons. And so, you know, what I want to, this is why I keep saying, what I really want us to be able to do is think about how all of this stuff fits together, right? How does this stuff all fit together, right? So when I started this paper, I said, you know, it's not that we have too much theory, right? It's, it's that we that theory is incoherent, right? So we focused on getting theory to be true, but we haven't focused on how theories have, should fit together to make sense of a situation, right? It's 
not that novelty is bad. It's bad when we think of it only in terms of context. So this is a weird context or a finding in relation to one theory. It's good when we think about, hey, is this something that what we believe we, to be true about a topic can't relate to, right? Practicality is not just the province of the manager. It's the province of us. You know, it'd be nice to know how to evaluate research better, right? Reviewers need good program, good, clear programmatic theory. The most frustrating thing in the world is to get an empirical piece of work that has a unit theory that is all buttoned up and neat and tidy and even with a great set of data. But in the end, they're saying that, and therefore turnover is a good thing. Oh, okay, no, like it's, we've got reams of research that says it's not, you can't just ignore that, right? You have to tell me what does this mean for that program of research, right? This is what we're trying to do. And so what am I saying we need to do as a field? This is my last slide. And then I'll get back into the, um, to the, to the um, discussion, right? It's look to the right. Look to the integration processes, right? We've written a lot about how to make theory and empirical work work together, right? How to have valid, reliable theory. What we need more of is understanding about what is integration? What does it mean for unit theories to fit together? What does it mean for programmatic theories to fit together? I mean, this is, this is a, these are very difficult topics, right? For all the reasons you guys are talking about, right? Um, like, you know, so I'm looking at, I just looked again, you know, Woody said, you know, how do we recognize ideas and theories that should be dropped? Can you imagine saying to the, uh, you know, like to a reviewer who really loves a theory, like that theory is no good and we shouldn't use it anymore. Ah, that theory, your paper's not getting published, right? There need, that's a system change, right? There needs to be a way to do that, right? Can we, can we find a way to have a more of a back and forth, more of a dialogue and more of a way to sort of say, hey, you know what? I thought this was true. I'm, it's not. Um, so the practical, it's Art Bedian, uh, by the way, um, Pacey. So uh, Art Bedian wrote the paper and it's and it's footnoted in my in my paper. Yeah, Jonathan, what's your. Uh, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a third year PhD student. So maybe looking at this from uh, a slightly you know, uh, uh, practical as well as um, overly theoretical mindset. But once we're post comps and we're working on our dissertation and, and I know a finished dissertation is the best dissertation, but yep. the opportunity that we have to fully contribute um, to theory is huge because all of our time and effort is focused on our, on our work at that time. Um, what, I wouldn't say steps, uh, because I think this is different than like a one, two, three process, but how do you advise us and encourage us to really start thinking in this way so that our dissertation and our research going forward can truly kind of bridge some of these bigger gaps that you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. So the first thing is learn programmatic theory. Understand that there's a collection of knowledge about the um, topic that you are interested in. And that is what is your job to learn. Now, a good advisor will be pointing you in that direction. But once you get out and you start needing to publish, we don't publish programmatic theory. We publish unit theory and verify and and uh, and, and empirical work mostly, uh, with the occasional you know annals paper or you know um, integrative review. Um, but what you can do is tell your reviewers right and tell the world. I am not just explaining an empirical oddity, or I am not just explaining an empirical finding, or I am not just, you know, trying to tell you something that piques your interest, right? I am trying to tell you something that advances what we know about an important topic. And whether that is a problem, to Anne's point, or a different theory, or a region of an organization, right? Like, there has to be something important in an organization that either right now or will sort of like matter, right? Your job is to connect what you are doing to knowledge, right? Data must be connected to knowledge. Knowledge is the programmatic theory, you know? Um, the, I think the other thing that is really important is um, we, when you're reviewing, right? I think, I think we, I almost wanna have more of this be the conversation, right? Like. 
you, you as a new person, right? Like as a new PhD student and someone who's going to be a new professor, you kind of got to get your chops down, right? But what I don't want you to do is get sucked into all of the mire of like, you know, making fancy new, you know, like flash in the pan alchemy type research, right? There's this, we all read this paper by Davis, 1971, that says, you know, what matters the theory is, uh, you know, not that it's right, but that it's interesting. Yeah, that's called bullshit. That's what that is, right? Like if something is interesting, but not true, that's bullshit, right? Read, read the, uh, you know, the, read the on bullshit thesis, right? It, that's exactly what it is. And that's not what we need to do as managers. And that may that leave that to journalists and bloggers, right? We have a sacred trust and I'm quoting Jim Walsh, here, right? He says, there's three professions that Don Rhodes, the clergy, judges and academics. And all of us have a sacred trust to promoting things in society that are going to be beneficial. And so that's that's my big soapbox, right? Remember that we are trying to put things together that can be useful.